morning, everyone. Uh, Deb, thanks for the very kind uh, introduction, and thanks to Caveras and team uh, for the invitation to come share a little bit of our uh, insights about working with FFPE tissue uh, over the last few years. Uh, I run a core facility uh, on the East Coast, so we get all sorts of different tissues coming in. Um, and I'm going to uh, go through our journey over, like I said, the past few years uh, of coming in. Um, so our journey began uh, in 2020 when a client first approached us wanting to work, uh, know if we could analyze FFPE tissue. We had been working with fresh frozen tissue from their, their lamb model, uh, and they had a lot. Uh, it, it's very hard to come by. It's an expensive animal model, so they had a lot of FFPE samples uh, they wanted us to try and work with. So as we usually do as a core, we jump into the literature, uh, and there are some outstanding labs out there that have been working on this for many years. Uh, but at that time, uh, interestingly, uh, there were a couple of publications hot off the presses that had built uh, off of those previous findings. Uh, so these, it's by no means a comprehensive list of, of publications, uh, but these were the, the three that we kind of zeroed in on. Um, they had built on publications we'd been following on how to work with tissue, and these happened to, to work with the FFPE. Uh, the one that also caught it interest was the hypersol workflow, which uh, used uh, the AFA um, workflow for homogenizing and emulsifying the, the uh, paraffin. But unfortunately, we didn't have the instrument in the lab. So we had some decisions to make. Um, what type of input material were we going to ask uh, our client to provide? Uh, were we going to ask for a scroll? Were we going to ask for a punch? Uh, different labs had worked with these and published on them. What size was going to be good for us to work with? Uh, what method were we going to deparaffinize with? Uh, we kind of zeroed in uh, on xylene and heptane versus the AFA, but as I just mentioned, unfortunately, uh, that wasn't an option for us at the time. Um, so extraction, uh, what were we going to do? We had been doing this with some fresh frozen tissue and small input tissue. We had a barocycler in the lab, so we knew that we were probably going to do high pressure uh, and high temperature cross-linking using the barocycler uh, at a high pH, high salt. And at the time, we were going to uh, use STC lysis buffer. We had been working pretty heavily with the IST workflow uh, in the lab uh, with excellent results. Uh, we do the digestion and the cleanup using it, and it was also available in a 96-well format. So these were the first four samples for proof of concept that came into our hands. Uh, we had a couple of 20 micrometer scrolls, a 10 micrometer scroll, and a one uh, millimeter biopsy punch, all of the, the lung tissue. Uh, and one thing you can see here is that it kind of came in in various forms, even though this was the same lab providing the material. Some of it was really tattery. Uh, one was a really tight scroll. Um, but that's why we asked for the test samples to, to kind of see what we got. Uh, one of the things is this was our first experience with FFPE, and we weren't really sure, even after addition of heptane for deparaffinization, how much was actually still um, paraffin and what was tissue in this. Um, but uh, after doing the deparaffinization, uh, we transferred it to the PCT tubes uh, and did the high pressure decrosslinking. Uh, and as you can tell, the input, some, you know, was variable forms. Some of it was very PC and flaky. Uh, but after uh, the pressure cycling, it all pelleted down nicely into to good tissue mush. Uh, and then we added our SDC buffer with a, a pestle, micro pestle. Uh, to continue the tissue extraction and the lysis buffer, and then followed that up with the IST digest uh, protocol we had been using, uh, followed by cleanup. Uh, the initial thing is we had taken a tiny bit of that and tried to do a protein assay, but didn't see yield, so we weren't really sure <laughs> if we'd gotten anything. Uh, but we did. We shot it on our, our QEHF at the time, a uh, two-hour DDA run, uh, and we got uh, almost 17... 150 proteins, uh, 6,600 peptides. Uh, miscleavages were about the same across. So the conclusion from that was, uh, back to our client, we can do this, bring on your samples. Uh, so the next step, uh, they decided on 25 samples uh, that they wanted us to analyze, but that was over a year and a half later. Um, it is often happens sometimes with collaborators and, and in a core, uh, you never know the timing of when the samples are going to come in. Uh, and they had switched without telling us from lung samples to brain. 
Um, no worries. Uh, we went ahead with the 20 micrometer scrolls. Uh, with the heptane deparaffinization that we had been working on previously, high pH, high salt. Uh, we still liked the extraction from the high pressure. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the barocycler, but um, there are several publications that show um, good extraction, and we had, we had seen that in our own hands, that we had seen better extraction out of tissues after the high pressure. Um, and then we followed that, uh, our lab and others at the time, the S-TRAP workflow with SDS, uh, we jumped in and we had shown, and others had shown that we got very good tissue yield using the SDS lysis buffer. Um, and we had moved to the S-TRAP plates for uh, a lot of digestions. So we decided to switch to that for this. And the added bonus with the, the brain tissues that we could also do the delipidation uh, on the S-TRAP, uh, followed by trypsin digestion, a C18 cleanup, uh, and then we were doing DIA. Uh, primarily in the lab, so we went ahead and, and went forward with that. Uh, some of the things that we noticed when working with these samples is that we, we did get variable protein yield out of that uh, when we did the protein assay, and one of the thoughts is, well, okay, we're dealing with scrolls, uh, and our client wasn't as forthcoming with what the tissue area was, so we were kind of guessing, so one of the thoughts is we had different tissue amounts coming out of that. Also, the tissue was very messy to work with. It was very gossamer-like, uh, and it did not pellet well like the lung tissue did after processing. Uh, so it ended up adding a lot of extra time. We had to take a lot of care not to remove any tissue when, when doing the rehydration uh, steps, and it add, we had to do extra spins and washes in order to get with that. So um, it added a lot of extra time to our workflow. But we got meaningful biology out of it. By the time we ran it on the mass spec, we got uh, 3,500 proteins in a single DIA shot, uh, and the client was thrilled. Uh, and based on those results, they decided they wanted to do additional samples from a different area of the brain. So this time, uh, trying to, to build on lessons learned, uh, we decided to ask for slides. Uh, we could actually see the area of tissues that, that we were going to be dealing with, and we thought scaling up would be a little bit easier by de doing the slides in bulk by dipping them in trays uh, for deparaffinization and rehydration. Uh, and then we ended up scraping that tissue into the PCT tubes uh, to, to follow through with that workflow uh, for decross-linking and extraction. And then again, we followed that up with an S-TRAP workflow for delipidation, trypsin digestion, followed by C18 cleanup. Uh, so that, at the time, uh, is a picture of our high-throughput workflow for FFPE. Uh, so uh, again, we got more meaningful biology. We got uh, higher yield uh, out of these uh, samples, and we, one of the reasons we thought is we didn't have as many steps and probably didn't lose as much tissue. Um, so the lessons learned at the time, 31 samples took a huge amount of time. It was a very large sample set for us at the time. Um, and comparatively, they were vats of xylene compared to putting a little bit in the tissues uh, in each tube and spinning them down. Uh, ended up, as I mentioned, being multiple rehydration steps, and it ended up being probably even more labor intensive than, than we had anticipated moving through. It was not exactly high throughput. Uh, and at the time, we were using the S-TRAP 96 well plate, but the downside of that is it used more tissue, uh, more input material, more, more uh, increased volumes of buffers, more enzyme, and we were worried that for a lot of the samples coming into the lab, people were going for lower input material, so it really wasn't going to be compatible with that. But again, as I mentioned, the results were excellent. The client was thrilled. Uh, but alas, the, the fellow that was driving the project moved on, and the publication is sitting in limbo. Uh, it may or may not happen, but the good news is, for us, we learned we could work well with FFPE tissues. So our next brief foray into the FFPE space, uh, the following year, we finally acquired a Coveris instrument, the R230, uh, hot off the presses uh, in the lab, and we had a couple of extra scrolls left over from method development. Uh, and I had been wanting to try the hypersol workflow for a long time, so um, with Coveris's guidance, we were able to give that a quick try, and we did get wonderful protein extraction. Uh, we used our SDS buffer for that. Uh, it did emulsify beautifully. Uh, the only thing we did learn is that we had a bit too much paraffin on it, so lesson learned trim as much excess off as possible before moving forward with this. Uh, but 
again, there were other projects in the lab where at the mercy is a core of what the clients want at the time. Uh, so we just knew we had this tool in our back pocket. So continuing on down the, the path of FFPE proteomics, late last summer, we were consulting with a client uh, over Zoom about their project. We had been working on fresh frozen uh, cardiac tissue with them. Uh, and I don't remember how, but somehow the subject of FFPE came up. Uh, and suddenly a colleague with whom we had been working with previously with cardiac tissue rolled into the screen and exclaimed, wait, did, did you say FFPE? Um, I mean, I didn't know he was there and he rolled in. So um, we're, we were back in the FFPE saddle uh, with his samples. He was extremely excited, enthusiastic, and said he had tons of samples waiting that he needed to be analyzed and he wanted to start off with 200 plus. And we were like, whoa, okay, we have to do a little bit of pro development here. Uh, as I mentioned, our previous workflow was not really uh, easily, even though 31 was high for us at the time, not exactly high throughput. Uh, we needed to work on things a bit. Um, so this was also a new tissue type. With any new tissue type, uh, most of you know, you have to probably do a little bit of tweaking and make sure uh, your methods translate well to it. Um, and we didn't want to, we knew we didn't want to deal with the toxic deparaffinization. That was something that was just annoying uh, from all the previous samples. Uh, we just wanted to get away from it, uh, especially for 192 samples. Uh, and as mentioned previously, our protocol really was not an option for 200 samples. So we came up with uh, several variables we wanted to test. We got some test samples uh, from this client. Uh, and we went uh, with our SDC buffer because we had seen good results with it versus SDS. The hypersol workflow had TEAB in it, but we had also seen very good results with the high salt, uh, high pH. Uh, we were going to test for, for tissue lysis and extraction bead beading versus AFA. Uh, and for the digestion, we wanted to, to we were going to compare the S-trap to the IST workflow. Uh, and we got uh, several samples, worked them up in triplicate. Uh, and got very good, fairly reproducible results. The, the striking thing to note here uh, is that on the left-hand side, those were the SDC extraction, and on the right-hand side was the SDS extraction. It didn't really matter uh, whether it was bead beading or AFA, uh, but there was a striking difference in whichever buffer was used. Uh, the decrosslinking, by the way, for all of these at the time was 60 minutes at 95 degrees. Um, so this is the normalized intensity of all of those injections, and basically this plot shows uh, that there really wasn't much sample variation across samples uh, going in, uh, as, as far as total intensity on the mass spectrometer, uh, and it also shows that we obtained and injected a similar amount of peptides. Uh, but going back to this one, these are unique peptides uh, for each condition. Uh, so we wanted to take a look at, uh, were there any uh, physiochemical parameters of the peptides that, that would explain why we saw such a difference. Uh, and this PCA plot uh, shows that uh, we got really nice clustering within each condition, uh, but we see they also seem to cluster, as you saw from the unique peptide yield, uh, based on extraction buffer, uh, with all the SDS kind of clustering together on the left side and the SDC clustering on the right side, maybe with the high pH, high salt kind of pulling away a little bit there at the top. but. Uh, Again, yes, this is triplicate, but, but first samples. Uh, one thing we did notice is with the SDC buffer, we tended to get a slightly more acidic peptides. Uh, with the SDS buffer, it was a little more evenly distributed across uh, PI of peptides. Uh, and for hydrophobicity, we got more hydrophilic peptides, or at least a trend that there were more hydrophilic peptides with the SDC, slightly more hydrophobic with the SDS. Um, we looked to see if there was a difference in the missed cleavages between the conditions, and not really. I mean, they were, they were pretty much the same across uh, all conditions. Uh, so then the other thing we decided to look at was, uh, were there any potential modification differences from the formal decrosslinking between these conditions that could explain why we saw that clustering? Um, and we identified which ones we we're going to use, and these are ones others have also used uh, in, and published on. But we identified them using an MS Fragger open search uh, using DDA data. Uh, and the major one that kind of came out was methylation, not unexpected. Uh, interestingly, the highest one was in the high salt uh, sample, but again, that was under 4%, and most of them hovered under 1%, so nothing salient there that would explain a lot of what was going on. So we decided to go ahead and proceed with the two 96 well plates of client samples. And on the left, we had the client 
put the scrolls in the TPX plate for us. Um, and then there's the example of, uh, as Deb mentioned, it's a very short AFA uh, treatment for all of these, uh, shearing all the DNA and emulsifying the, the paraffin. And it's nice, even, beautiful emulsification of it uh, across all samples. Uh, and that's what it looked like after decrosslinking. We did the 95 degrees uh, for 60 minutes. Uh, and then, as I said, previously we wanted to move down to the, the smaller S-trap uh, using less input material and everything. Unfortunately, it really ended up not being very user-friendly because it's not really set up for a 96 well format. Uh, but we did process all 192 samples and they are placed in the minus 80 awaiting the mass spec to be fixed and open, ready to run. Um, meanwhile, we still wanted to work on streamlining and getting a more user-friendly uh, workflow. Um, and we still wanted to make it more amenable to higher throughput with the big stumbling block kind of being the digestion. Uh, so this attempt was uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, using the Covaris PAC uh, workflow, uh, using the Covaris tissue lysis buffer, which also has SDS in it. Um, but we did the AFA lysis and emulsification of the paraffin. Uh, we did a high temperature de decross linking at 95 for uh, 90 minutes. Um, followed by another round of AFA lysis and emulsification. Uh, and then we did a protein assay and did a, did a protein aggregation capture, uh, which allowed us to do extra isopropanol uh, washes on these, on, on bead, to kind of remove any residual paraffin. Um, and then we followed that with an on-bead di trypsin digestion and ammonium bicarbonate, uh, an SDBRP cleanup, and a single-shot DIA run. And we were thrilled with the results. In triplicate, we got over 4,000 proteins quantified in each sample. And more importantly, most of the peptides were identified in all samples across all samples. Um, so the conclusions uh, from all of our journey is that working with at larger FFPE cohorts is an op in an operationally efficient manner is actually a reality with the AFA workflow. Uh, getting away from toxic chemicals for deparaffinization was huge for us. Uh, and we were paying through this journey special attention uh, to trying to streamline and make the time at the bench and the personnel time more efficient. Um, in the future, we'll work uh, on shortening the instrument time uh, with gradients and stuff, but we know that we can work with scrolls, punches, uh, laser capture, uh, microdissection material. It's all very workable. Um, so future directions when we come back to the lab is we're going to continue evaluating and implementing the, the true prep workflow that Deb had mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it's all in, in you know, from, from tissue to peptides. Uh, we're going to continue to look uh, and optimize the depth and digestion efficiency uh, using the AFA enhanced uh, digestion. We haven't done that yet, uh, but as Deb mentioned, it, it takes the digestion uh, time way down. Uh, which is going to be fantastic for larger cohorts. Um, we're going to compare it to the overnight digest, of course. Uh, and then post-digestion, we're not sure if we see any difference or if there's any real reason to go with either C18 or SDBRP cleanup. Uh, we're going to continue with single-shot DIA. Uh, and as mentioned, we're going to uh, look at, at streamlining the chromatography, either with our EvoCEP and or shorter gradients. Uh, and then we're also looking at integrating these into a, uh, an automated workflow, uh, which the R230 will actually fit onto a lot of the automated workflow platforms. So um, just continuing to streamline. Uh, but that's our journey as it stands today. So a special thanks to our collaborators uh, at Penn and Children's Hospital and the fantastic team at Covaris that has been with us uh, this whole journey before we got a R230 in the lab and not. I've always believed in the technology and it's for fresh frozen and for FFPE, it's just worked beautifully. Uh, cells, all sorts of tissues, it's worked well. Uh, and this is the team I'm lucky enough to call my colleagues and get to work with every day. I couldn't do any of this without them. Stellar group of people and most importantly, thank you all for your attention. Uh, and I'm welcome, I'll, I'll welcome any questions you might have uh, either now or later. I don't know what our timing is, but thank you.